An engine of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway steams through a valley cut deep by an Ice Age glacier. It's a valley which has, in different centuries, been densely wooded, well cultivated, but never heavily populated. Now the railway is a tourist attraction, and Bracken is claiming back many of the fields. Long after the Ice Age, the Romans settled in this area and built a stone causeway across the wild moor tops. By the time of the Norman Conquest, it was a landscape of marshy valleys and wooded slopes. Here, on a craggy limestone hill, stood Pickering at a natural crossing point on a route that ran from east to west along the northern edge of a wide and low-lying vale. At this point stands Pickering Castle. This church stands where, in Anglo-Saxon days, there might have been a wooden chapel and a small settlement of single-storey hutments. It was only the higher land that was available for building a castle. The low land was wet and undrained. This outer wall, the curtain wall, built on a mound and ditch, was a strong piece of stonework. But from the earliest records of the reign of King John, we learn that it originally consisted of a ditch and bank with a palisade of pointed stakes on top. This was known as an herison, from the French word for hedgehog. The whole castle was constructed of soil and timber, a mammoth task for men who worked with simple picks and shovels. On the northern side of the castle, the outer ditch is very deep indeed, making any attack on this small postern gate set in the base of a tower a very difficult venture. And if an attacker did get past this first defence and through the well-guarded tower, then he would find himself in the ditch at the bottom of the mound on which the central tower is built. There would have been little chance of him escaping an attack from above. This was a dry moat, and it was never filled with water. The moat extends right round the inner ward of the castle, the oldest part of the building, and circles the central keep built in William the Conqueror's time, when it would have been made of wood, not stone. Centuries of feet have trodden these steep steps to the keep, passing at the bottom the remains of a plain square tower which served both as a defensive position and as a prison for those offending against the lord of the manor. Records do not tell us how many times the castle faced determined enemies, but this simple hill across the valley may be a mound from which a siege was mounted. As weaponry developed, wooden palisades were hardly strong enough defence and even the addition of an outer area, called a barbican, was not sufficient. Work began on rebuilding in stone, and at each corner of the castle, towers were constructed that would serve both as defensive points and dwelling rooms. By the middle of the 14th century, the general plan of the castle was complete. But castles were not only military places, they were for living in as well. Inside the walls, there would be a whole community of knights, their wives, children, and those who served them. Villagers and peasant farmers would live outside. The inner and outer wards were once connected by a drawbridge beneath a gateway, housing the bridge mechanism. We can imagine, perhaps, how, where there is now well-kept lawn, there would have been stables for the many horses and soil cultivated to provide vegetables for castle dwellers. But whatever the changes, the central keep remained. It was a hollow structure without a roof, but with a wall walk round which defenders could patrol. From this keep, the lord of the manor could see the land he administrated for the king. To the north, there was the forest, vital to the life of the castle 
and as the king's hunting grounds. Maintaining the forest and preventing thefts of game and timber were two of the castle's main functions. South, beyond the village, lay marshy flatlands more suitable for hunting wildfowl than for farming. For some time after the Ice Age, the area would probably have been a vast lake. And at the edge of the marshes along higher land, the road ran west towards the castles of Helmsley and Moulton. The castle stood above the village, emphasising perhaps the way it overwhelmed the inhabitants and controlled the lands. In the first place, it had probably been built as part of King William's subjugation of the north. It's very easy to forget that families lived within these walls and that life was not all battles and sieges, but full of the chores of daily life and running a community. In a northern corner of the inner ward was a group of half-timbered buildings known as the Constable's Lodgings. From ground level, we may recognise little of the buildings. But from above, we can see the ground plan of the hall and smaller buildings, which include storage houses for wool, which earned one-sixth of the castle's income. In another part of the inner ward were two huge ovens for baking bread. These were kept warm by a constant supply of timber brought in from the forests. A little way across a cobbled yard was a chapel dating back to the early 13th century. Later, a resident chaplain was installed. It's a small and simple building dedicated to St Nicholas, made of much smaller stones than the main walls of the castle, and with narrow slit windows that had glass fitted from an early date. The stonework of the walls has crumbled badly, but the Rosamond Tower still reveals the ground floor living space behind narrow slit windows and the wall walk which ran round the whole of the outer walls between three towers. In this castle, the towers were set at corners of the outer walls and projected outwards to give a 180 degree lookout. It was not intended that any enemy could approach the walls unnoticed and the wall walk on the inner side of the wall combined with a ditch on the outside gave great defensive strength. The Diati Hill Tower has three floors. The upper floors, reached by a wide flight of steps built against the base of the tower, would be the living rooms and would include a garderobe or simple toilet. A fireplace suggests some degree of winter comfort. Below is a storage area, a natural cool box for sides of meat and barrels of drink. We don't know how many families lived within the castle, but there would certainly be hunters and men at arms and there would be a number of young children and elderly people as well. But however families lived and spent their time, maintaining law and order remained one of the castle's most important functions. Its authority, the authority of the king and the lord of the manor, had to be respected. These walls suggest a spacious building, and early records tell that it was built both of timber framing and stone, with an elaborately plastered upper room. Known as the King's Hall, it served for many years as a courthouse. The recess in which this visitor stands is not a chimney, but a place for the presidential chair when the court was in session. From this seat, both trivial and serious crimes would be tried. Many of the crimes concerned the forest, and perhaps most frequent amongst them, the charge of assarting, or the unauthorised clearing of forest land for cultivation. Such offenders would probably be imprisoned in the cellars of the corner towers. It was the finest building in the castle. In different forms, this central keep survived for 400 years. 
From its wall walk, the castle dwellers would have a bird's eye view of the whole castle. They would see the entrance gate, keeping an eye on who came in or went out. It is now an unimpressive doorway, but in the stonework, we can see that at that time it would have been a full gatehouse with drawbridge, across which would come visitors, tradespeople and the townsfolk of Pickering. Now in ruin, the ditches, mounds, walls and towers of the castle hold many clues to its history and its construction. Thank you. 